So good morning and welcome to the presentation, Raising Chickens in Small Spaces. My name is Lori George and I'm a local foods small farms educator with University of Illinois Extension, housed in the Mount Vernon area. Our presenter today is James Theory, who is also an educator on the local foods small farms team, who serves at the Grundy, Kankakee, and Will counties. His guest speaker for today uh, will be uh, Pam Utterback. Pam is a researcher, a nutrition researcher for poultry at the University of Illinois uh, campus in Urbana. So uh, welcome both uh, James and Pam. I'd also like to mention that I've raised chickens since I was seven, so I don't just have research, I have actual background experience with raising small flocks of chicken. Excellent, thank you, Pam. And my experience goes to six chickens only at most. <laughs> Anyways, um, everybody has a handout that we gave. Uh, you can download that and follow along. And um, I think uh, you also mentioned, Rolly, that anybody who has a question can go to the chat box and put the question there, and so, so we'll answer them. But thank you so very much for the introductions, Rolly, and Thank you everyone for joining in. Um, so it's a time, uh, it's a lovely, it's a, where shall I put this? It's a great time to be wanting to keep chickens for two reasons. One, the local food movement is growing, and gaining popularity and people want to raise their own eggs or even chickens for meat. And then secondly, at this time of our lives, when we have this pandemic, hey, we have the time, we're at home, we can raise some chickens. And what I've been hearing from some of you homeowners, especially, is that you are unable to get chicks just because the demand is just too heavy. But I think they have started, the hatcheries have stepped up their thing and they're probably going to be available a little bit more. And so let's get going here. Before you think about raising chickens is to find out what your zone, zonation laws are, zoning laws. So uh, here in Kankakee, we have three cities here, Bobonay, Bradley, and Kankakee. But only Kankakee allows us to keep hens. And that's a keyword right there. Five hens, no roosters. And they don't specify what we're supposed to do with the coops. You notice like the Nepaview place, you're supposed to be cleaning that coop every day. Uh, well, you know, it's all a question of what they tell you to do, you have to do. But, but get to know if you have the, the, zone, the zoning laws allowing you to keep the chickens, otherwise you don't start. Right, and the zoning laws are different for all the different places. Like in Chicago, there's no limit, but you just can't have meat birds and you can't have roosters. And here in Champaign-Urbana, you can have six hens, no roosters. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so why raise chickens? You want to produce your own food and you have control over how you raise those chickens. It is sustainable because you get manure and they'll eat all the bugs in the yard. You have pestia, pestia products. I, that I can say, you know, when I raise my own chickens, I have pestia products. And it's an easy livestock to raise. And if you have kids or younger people, they learn the responsibility of taking care of a chore like, like, uh, like uh, raising chickens. And for some people, it's therapy, it's great pets. I always get a kick of letting my six chickens out in the evening and the first thing they do is just run and jump and open their wings and they're just happy to be outside. And later on in the uh, presentation, we'll talk about raising chickens and we'll come back to that. And then a very often asked question that I've had is, when, what breed should I raise? And that question is dependent on why you wanna raise the chickens. Is it just the eggs? Or do you want them for meat? Do you want them for both? Uh, do you want uh, 
calm and friendly birds. You want beautiful ones. You like white ones as opposed to brown ones. It's really all over the place. The preference is up to you. And over here, I have a few pictures. The BPR would be the, the bad bar Plymouth. Bad Plymouth rock, the one I have in the center there. The CI is the Cornish rock. The W would be the Wyan dot. They all have their pros and cons. And I'll talk about a few of them in the next few slides. And the very first one is the, um, I don't know if you can see the name there. This is the Rhode Island Red. It's an American breed of domestic chicken. It was produced way back when as a cross between Oriental chickens from Malay crossed with the leghorns from Italy and produced this duo purpose breed which lays brown eggs and it is famed for the many and better eggs. Well, that's probably debatable, famed for many and better eggs and it's great for the backyard. Great for the city, if you're in an urban setting or anywhere else, it's a great one for the backyard. It is very hardy in any environment. It goes through the winter just fine. It's very friendly. You approach it, it's, it's, it's just friendly. And they are great foragers if you wanna have a part of, if you wanna save on your feed, this would be great if you want to let them out to go and forage, that would probably save 10% of your feed, which is probably the most expensive part of raising chickens. And they are known to raise up to 300 eggs. So that's Rhode Island Red, and it's called Rhode Island Red because it was developed in Rhode Island, I think, and that's their state bird. But the white legons, they are great layers, and they will do up to 320 uh, eggs, more like 280. And those are very nice, large white eggs that they lay. They are very athletic. They are very hardy. I mean, go through the winter just fine. They are poor brooders. They don't like to sit on eggs that much. And they are also very frighty and flighty as well. They can, they get startled so easily. And they're not that friendly. You approach them, they wanna take off. They don't wanna hang around. They are very light. They don't put too much of the feed you give them into meat. They put more of their food into the eggs. That's why they are great layers. And I would like for time to see if these are two variants that I'm showing here of the white leg one. You see the one on the right there, the small caption there has the comb is bent. The others have an upright comb. Are these two variants of the white leg ones? Actually, the ones in the larger photo are probably younger. They're pullets and cockerels. Well, the, co the cocks are never supposed to have a flopped over comb. But for leggerns, that's actually how they got their name from a hat that they wore in the part of Italy where that bird was developed. It's called mm -hmm. apparently a leghorn. So right. actually that's a defect on most other breeds, but for legger and females, they always are supposed to have a lop comb when they're older. All right. I have three of these in addition to Rhode Island Reds, reds and I'm very happy with them. All right. I added this picture there just for us backyard uh, chicken raisers. We may want something that looks really cute so that when our guests come, Hey, it's an attraction. This bird is an attraction. Or if you have kids that want to do it at the fair, you know, showing birds, then there are so many types that look fancy that you can select from. This is just one of them. It is a massive Asian breed, which is a buff cocking. It is covered abundantly with feathers and came originally from China. And like I said, it's a sensation. He has extremely good temperament. It's a very calm chicken. You can walk up to it, pick it up. It doesn't uh, mind. And it is great for both backyard and, and, and other types of settings. And it has brown eggs. It's not a great layer. 
doesn't lay that many. It actually lays less than 200 in a year. And it is cold tolerant. Again, with all this warmth, it should be able to handle the cold. Those birds look like they might be good for meat, but actually the most of that is feathers. They don't have a lot of body meat on them. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But I love them, they're beautiful. All right. And then we come to the standard meat chicken in the US, the Cornish cross. This bird, it was bred for rapid weight gain and it is a huge bird you should i should have shown you another picture from the front the gate the the way the, the span between the two legs is really wide it has a very big chest there has very rapid weight gain and it uh, amasses a whole lot of weight it's very seldom broody the egg size in, is medium it has a very calm temperament and it is a large fowl it's a big bird that's that's precisely what it is and we shall talk about it later when we talk about pastured poultry poultry it is one of the more favorite uh, breeds and then we come to the bird plymouth plymouth rock is a dual or papa's bird so both good for eggs and meat it's very good for small farms very friendly as well. They are great layers. They do large brown eggs, very cold, uh, very weather tolerant, cold weather tolerant. And it's okay with confinement, but like all other birds, they like it when you let them go out and forage out in the open. So those are three or four, four breeds that, that you can choose from. And so the choice is really you as what, do you, what would you like to have? And I've seen people that mix these breeds. Again, I've been to uh, homes where the, the, the breeds are mixed, two of this and two of that and two of that. Just nice to have uh, whatever you want to have. Okay, what would be a chicken raising production schedule? So if you wanted to start right now raising chickens, what do you need to do? Uh, plan ahead, four weeks ahead, and place your order. There are so many hatcheries. You could go to a hatchery. You could uh, go online and find a hatchery. You could find a friend who is uh, who is doing what? Uh, hatching chicks. Uh, you could do your own hatching if you find a incubator and get fertile eggs. Then you could do your own, and so forth and so forth. And then two weeks before, get the necessary equipment, the feeders, the waterers, um, and, and then decide how you're going to construct your brooder. It could be, I mean, brooders, and we'll talk about them in a minute. And then the movable coop. Does it have to be movable? Not really. But if you are keeping four, five, six chickens, yeah, why not make it movable and move it all over the place and let the chickens go to different places in your yard. And then one week before, order the feed. And then, of course, if there are chicks, it have to be chick feed, starter feed. And we'll talk about that as well. The day of pickup, you place the chicks in the brooder boxes and you give the starter feed and water as soon as possible, especially water. And that place should be warm by the time they get there. Don't start warming it when they arrive. Don't start looking for water when you have the chicks out there. You just brought them in. A friend I work with actually lost 26 out of 60 chicks just because she kept it out there and was getting ready, you know, starting to get ready. By the time she got ready, most of them had died. Then at three weeks old, they'll have fully feathered and can go out into coop. They'll have graduated from the, the brooder box now. And at six weeks old, you can switch to a ration that is for more mature birds. If it's broilers, then you give them the broiler ration. If they are layers, you, get, you give them that. Okay. So the brooder is a simple thing to make. The top right hand corner, what you're seeing there is a kid's 
uh, what do you call that? Kid, um, the place where you put the kids to swim. Yes, that's, that's, that's what you see there with lots of wood shavings. And then just to make sure that the sides are raised higher, there's cardboard box all around. That reduces the draft that will get to the chickens and um, also contains the heat a little bit better because you'll have a lamp under, uh, above, above the whole setup. That's simple enough and it will be able to accommodate the watering, the waterer as well as the feeder and then the lamp above and four chicks will be quite happy to live in here. And you could start with the paper, you could start with the newspapers at, at the bottom, especially if you are setting up a brood. I have set up a brood myself in my garage, which is cemented. Well, of course, it's concrete floor. And I put in newspapers so that they don't walk on cold uh, concrete. So there are all sorts of modifications. Bottom right hand corner there, just buy yourself a, a tub, make holes in the cover just so that you have ventilation and three or four chicks or five should be able to, uh, to, to, to live happily in there. And so the warmth, you want that warmth up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit to be reduced by five degrees Fahrenheit every week of growth of these chicks until you achieve uh, the fully feathered uh, condition. And the light should be on more hours than less so that you have like 18 hours of daylight and six of darkness or even more hours of daylight. And of course, you've already gotten the equipment, the feeders and waterers and the chick housing should be draft free. We already mentioned that, but must have ventilation that you've seen in the last two pictures there to prevent both bacterial and fungal growth and the pollution that happens in there. Two to four inches of bedding litter, and that should be changed every so often, and you can keep an eye on how the, what the condition of it is. The heat source, and we'll talk about that in a second. We start off at 95 and reduce that, as we said, and the chicks will tell you if the temperature is too high or too low. If it's too high, raise the lamp up a little bit more. If it's too low, bring it down some more. And if brooding in, is, in, is in the same unit as the adult chickens, with, with the adult chickens, make sure you really isolate those chicks properly. Some more examples of brooders, and you're familiar with all these uh, kinds of containers. The middle one is like what I made one time with, you know, concrete floor, the wood shavings, and then the border. And you notice, I should say, a border where which is circular is better than one which is which has corners because if the chicks congregate at one corner, the one that is trapped in the corner can be suffocated. And that would be less of a likelihood of a risk if you have rounded walls, like you see in the other two pictures there. The materials to use for leader, anything like soft pine wood shavings will do it, straw, ground up corn cobs, the University of Illinois down there, they use a lot of that. The rice house, and like I said, they use newspapers too, spread two to four inches deep, and they will, as soon as they absorb up to 30% moisture, remove them. Because high moisture is problem problematic for respiratory, in the respiratory system. So the corn cob bedding, you see it there. Um, the pine shavings are great, especially in the nest boxes. If you have them clean and all that, you will not get your eggs poopy if you, if you clean up as often as possible. And the straw is being shown on the top, on the bottom left hand picture there. Again, we cannot, we cannot, 
we cannot uh, underemphasize the importance of water for chicks. When these chicks arrive through the post office and UPS, they've come, they've been shaken all over like, like nobody's business. And although they do have a little bit of water in the yolk that is still remaining in them, they, they really get um, thirsty. So the first thing you want to do when they arrive is give them water that is clean and, and all that. So, and you place it in the brooder before the chicks arrive, the, 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 the heater, the lamp, because it has heat, will raise that temperature a little bit for, for the chicks. And here you have an example of chicks that are getting water from nipples. Now that's the best way to give them water because chicks or chickens for that matter, cannot suck up water. Chickens um, put water in the mouth and then they raise the mouth so that water goes into the belly by gravity. So this arrangement is great. And all you need to do is show one of the chicks how to get water from the nipple. That's it, everybody else gets to follow. When they grow older, of course, you can change to the waterers that you can buy from, or the, by the way, the first one you can make yourself. You just buy the nipples, you can just find a bucket, you can make it yourself. These are the waterers, you buy them from Farm and Fleet. And see, this one is on a concrete, concrete block. Would be, if another concrete block was placed on top of that other block, it would raise this a little bit higher to bring the level of water to the shoulder height of the bird. That helps it quite a bit. It doesn't have to bend over too much. And therefore it doesn't have to be sipping too many times. Chicken feed. Mother hen knows best what to give her chicks. Now we also need to know what to give these chicks. We have conf they're in confinement. And the feed will vary with species and the breed and the age and the gender. So there are lots of things to consider. The first thing is these brand new chicks need lots of protein in their diet because they're developing muscle. So they need lots of that, which will get less and less with time. Can you make your own feed? Yes, if you know how to, but it is a very uh, how shall I say, challenging thing to do. You have to go buy methionine, which is an essential amino acid that has to be in a certain amount in 25 pounds of the mix. And then you have to think about energy, you have to think about the protein, you have to think about other vitamins. I mean, it's just, you just have to be very precise with what you're doing to make good food. That's why I have emphasized that with in red font. And then you use the right feed. We know that laying hens need lots of calcium because they are making shells for the eggs. Why would we be wanting to give chicks uh, laying layers ration uh, when they don't need that much calcium? They need it for the bones, yes, but not in the amounts that laying hens do. So again, be careful what you feed these chicks, the brand new chicks. Or Equipment for providing the feed is available easily, or you can make your own. In, this, in the top right-hand picture there, those are PVC pipes with those joints at the bottom that you can just make yourself and just put the feed in that and let the chickens be. And over time, and there was a question asked by one of us, might be one of the participants, over time you'll get to know how long it takes for the chickens to finish that food, which means if you put food in those uh, containers there and you want to go for three, four days, and you know it takes them six days, you will know that, you will know that you are, you're good to go. Same thing with water. If you have a water container and you know how long it takes, or you have a reservoir which fits in a valve that can keep uh, replenishing uh, used water, you can, you can still go and 
you know, come back in and find every, everything okay? That was one of the questions that was asked by a participant. The brooder set up now, uh, water should not be too close to the heat source. Um, it will interfere with the movement, obviously. If they want to go up and warm up and it's in the way, then they'll start stepping in the water and water is not good for these chicks. You don't want them getting wet. Same thing with feed and water, should not be close together. You want the chick to walk a little ways away from the feed, go find water. That that um, that should be the right way. And then the heat source should be positioned so that chicks can get away from the heat if they need to. We talked about too much heat or too little heat. Find the best position by observing them. And then of course, you always want to check the temperature at the chicks level. They are the ones that are feeling, sensing the heat. So you need to check it from down there, not next to the lamp. And so this cartoon here gives you various uh, scenarios. If everybody is spread out in the, in the brooder, then that means everything is pitchy. If, it's, if they are all in one tight area there, maybe it's drafty or it's drafty. And maybe that's the way the heat is being uh, channeled to that end where they are. Where the, where they are. Or maybe the draft is coming just above them, so they are getting away from where the, the, the draft may be hitting them on the other side. If it's too cold, of course, they'll congregate underneath the light. If it's too hot, they'll try their best to go a farthest away. And the other cartoon there shows you how to, uh, one possible arrangement of the feeders and the waterers in the, in the brooder. Lighting, it varies with whether you have broilers or layers. And the first few days to one week, just leave the lights on full time. Let these chicks feed. And then after that, with the broilers, you, you vary as shown there, the second week, 16 hours of light to eight hours of darkness. And third week of maturity, 20 hours, of, of light and four hours of darkness. They're eating to gain weight and you wanna get them out of there as soon as they get to slaughter weight or processing weight. With the layers, first week again, just like the broilers, 24 hours of light. And then you keep varying as shown there until after the 18th week, you increase by about 30, I can't see what I have written there, but at the 18th week, some birds are ready to lay. So others do it at five to six weeks later on. So again, uh, if it's winter time, you want to be increasing the day length and we'll talk about that in a second. So, um, or if you're just uh, nice to the birds, let me put it that way, if you just wanna let natural cost, it take its, uh, its, its cost. Then just leave the light alone, don't vary it too much. Yeah, these are lighting schedules that we use here, but mm -hmm. a lot of people get their chicks at this time of the year because the natural light outside is increasing slowly. So you don't really have to light them per se if you just have them on daylight, but obviously for brooders, you have to need it, you need it on for longer than that, plus the heat. But um, yeah, so don't get hung up on, oh, I have to do, that. but if you do want your chickens to keep laying through the winter, that's when you'll have to supplement their light when the day length starts decreasing. Thank you. And so in the brooder, all these things are happening. The, the body systems are developing the internal organs, the immune system, the feathers, the digestive system, they're learning to live with each other. I mean, all these things are happening in these first three weeks in the brooder, so. Okay, and then now let's go to housing. There was another question about the best housing and there's no answer to that one. Um, I just, just no one answer to that. But 
There are some general things about housing for the backyard uh, chicken raiser. Keep it simple and functional. If you're looking at the cartoon or the diagram that is over there, you see there's a run outside where they can come out during the day, enjoy the sun, sun themselves, stretch a little bit. And then you see there's a little stairway getting into the, what I would call the bedroom, where they go patch and spend the night. And then on the side, which is not showing very well of that bedroom, this side that we can see, there is a nest box where they can go lay eggs and you can come and get the eggs from this side. And then there are two windows above the nest box and maybe the cover of this small bedroom has some space between it that allows for ventilation because you don't want any accumulation of ammonia and other gases in there. And then if you have a chicken wire floor, the chicken droppings will probably come beneath there where you can just pull that manure out easily. And then with two people, maybe four people, this can be moved to a different part of the yard. So it's simple. And the, 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 the bedroom is draft free. And if you had some wheels, even better. You don't need that much help moving it around. And so if you just look at this picture here and figure out what you'd like for your backyard chickens, then get some, I've given you a reference at the very end where there's lots of free designs of chicken coops and there are so many of them. So, but some general guidelines inside the coop, the bedroom, give birds two to three square feet per bird, okay? Outside about four square feet, just the general guideline. With the wagon type chicken tractor, and we we'll talk about that in the pasture pottery, for completely raised free range, it's very good for free range raised chickens. I have a picture later on. And there you allow two to three square feet, just like the other one. And then the movable tractor with a run, open style, wire pen with some shelter, which is movable. If you want to plan to do, um, to raise 50 or 100 meat birds, you can make a simple structure that is half uh, covered for, for, you know, for protection against the elements. And the other half is open and you can move it around and you still feed them, but they are also eating other things in the pasture. And that's additional value to the meat and the eggs, if you're doing that for eggs. And two square feet is generally good enough between six to eight weeks. Six weeks, you probably will be done with, with them and they need to go on to processing. So that's the chicken coop tractor that you can move around in the, in the yard. That's and this is a big one, of course. This is not just for four chickens. It's, if you have 30, 40, maybe something like that, you can make a smaller one, still on wheels. Again, uh, the modifications are many. On the right-hand side, it's another one. And then you're starting to get the idea. You have a place for the chickens to run. They have a place to go and roost in the evening. You're protecting them from the elements. The ventilation is great. You see a small hole over there and you have a nest box behind there. You're starting to get the idea about how to design these coops. Somebody asked about a predator-proof coop. This one is done with PVC pipes, the green ones. And then the chicken, oh no, it's not chicken wire, but it is wire mesh that is strong enough that is then tied to the hoops. And you also have that in the bottom of you know, this coop. That way, even those weasels or whatever that can dig underneath and get, get, try to get to the chickens can make it. And you can move this around, you see the handles there, and the chickens can go around eating grass wherever you take them. 
and by the way, this is supposedly one coup that anybody can make. It's, it's very simple. The A-frame chicken coop is probably one of the most cost effective, what is the word? Cheapest, let me put it that way. It is portable, it's light enough. For the weight to space ratio is probably the most efficient design. They have enough room down here that will give them enough sun and movement and air, and they can always go up to the triangular bedroom up there and sleep there and lay eggs there. So it's, it's really a very simple coop. That, that, so th those of you that are crafty can make. Okay. Hey, if you have an old car in the yard, give it to the chickens. They are very forgiving. They don't mind whatever you give them. If you have an old car, just turn it into a coop. They'll take it. That's it about housing. Oh, and if you want housing also from farm and fleet, I see coops there costing 200, the more uh, expensive ones, maybe 300, 299, um, but they make them as well. If you want one that's ready made. Let's talk about chicken eggs. When a chick hatches, it's got all the eggs it's going to lay when it becomes a laying hen in its adult life. All these, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but all these eggs there, it's born with them. It has them all. And then when it gets to whatever, 18, 18 weeks, 20 weeks, 25 weeks, then each one of these starts to uh, develop. Each one of these eggs starts, the, the, the yolk begins to build up. And then the yolk starts to move along the, the oviduct, which is the, the, the canal through which the egg comes out. And as it goes through, it picks up albumin or the white of the egg. And at the same time, that gets encased in an eggshell. And chicken eggs should never get poopy because the channel through which feces come out and the channel through which the egg comes out are completely different. And the nun interferes with the other. The, the egg never has to touch the, the anal part of the, uh, of the chicken. That's why they come out so clean. Everything got figured out by the, by, by the chicken. And so I just wanted to show you that little cartoon here just to make that point. And we'll be talking about cleaning eggs later in a minute. People ask why the different shells of eggs look different. It's all in genetics. And um, the Arocana type of birds will lay uh, blue eggs. And why would anybody want blue eggs? Because, just because. And they're nice. Some people like that color. On the other hand, if you have enough of them at Easter time, you'll be selling each egg for a dollar. So your 12 eggs will fetch you $12 a piece. Most people want those types of, for those types of eggs. But it's all genetics. That's nothing. And if you looked at the ear, and yes, chickens have ears too. If you look at the ear color of the chicken, it can tell you what the color of the egg will be, which is, uh, which is the next thing I think you, yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying there. It can tell you what the color of the egg will be. What about the yellow color? I used to believe that the stronger yellow was different in terms of nutrition and all that, but no, I've been told it's all a question of the diet that went into the, what, what did they eat? Was it soybean for protein or something else? What did they eat? And that will determine the color, which I have not in, displayed very well here, but you've seen this, you've seen some, some yolks that are stronger, but they taste stronger, some of them, when they are yellower. 
And whatever the chicken eats is going to affect the flavor and the nutrition of the eggs. I have brown eggs and white eggs all getting, all chickens are all getting the same food, mm -hmm. same nutrition. It's just what they eat. So yes, your farm raised chickens, like if they go forage, are going to have darker yolk than my eggs in the cage house because my birds don't go outside and aren't able to feast on the grass and other things that have things that'll help the yellow and the orange and the yolk show up more. Yes. And so there are people who think that the brown eggs are better than the white. Not really. Not so. So it's a myth. But people will pay more for the brown eggs, do you know? It takes more money to make a brown egg than a white egg. Actually, brown egg layers are not as efficient as those white leg and white egg layers. Oh, so that's right. Plus, we can tell people that it's... <laughs> They're, people just think they're better for you. They're not. If they've been fed the same diet, there's no mm -hmm. different nutrition. They just cost mm -hmm. more to make because it takes more feed to make a brown egg than a white egg. That's correct. Yes. And then finally, we do candling to check on egg quality. And uh, the next slide here shows about candling chicken eggs. When we have this class here in Kankakee, Pam comes with the uh, demonstration items here and shows us eggs on the inside but if you're about to incubate eggs you want to know the condition of that egg what's the quality is the egg good enough and they have ways of doing that which i'm not an expert in and then once the incubation process begins you can still pick that egg and check if the embryo is developing properly yeah we actually use candling for two different purposes we use it to candle to see if the embryos are developing, and that usually only works really well on white shelled eggs. The brown mm -hmm. and other colored shelled eggs are too dark. But also, one thing they use candling for in egg processing plants is to determine how big the air cell is, and also to look for any blood spots or other form material that sometimes slough off of the oviduct and get into the egg, because they don't want people getting those eggs. Okay. And the training for that is not that difficult. A flashlight should be adequate. And if somebody knows what they are looking for, you might find a blood spot once in a while, but that's not a big deal. Um, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. What about collecting and storing eggs? We've already talked about providing a very clean egg laying area and your eggs will be clean. Remember that picture I showed you. And most of us don't want to wash the eggs because there's the bloom. And I don't know if I spelled the bloom correctly. Is it B-L-U-M-E or is it B-L-O-O-M? It's B-L-O-O-M. So uh, correct, okay, bloom on- It's also called the cuticle. Mm -hmm. for, uh, I mean, you'll hear different terms, but it's just that last final layer that a hen puts on the shell before it comes out. And that's protective of the egg. I mean, and the egg, the shell has pores, pores on it. And the bloom covers that. So no bacteria can go inside the egg. So yeah, that's its natural way of protecting the egg from invasion by bacteria. However, if you have some dirt on egg, a little spot here and there, you can brush it off. Now, if it's really, really dirty, then you want to wash it. First of all, if you're selling it to somebody else, you don't want to give them poopy eggs. Wash with warm water. You don't want to use cold water because cold water will cause the egg inside to shrink. And once it shrinks, there is suction pressure. So again, the very same bacteria that you're trying to wash off gets drawn in. So you want water that is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than the, the egg, anyhow. Okay. And then once that's done, you store in fridge. Um, this day and age, I think they tell us to do it not on the door, but maybe the second shelf, too close to the coldest place. I've had eggs myself that froze. And I think we can store for up to four months. Yeah, I usually keep them for three or four months if I've picked them up fresh. And one thing that helps keep eggs fresher, the quality better, is if you store them with the small end down in the cartons and in a closed egg carton. 
those things that they made to put in the door of refrigerators are like the worst invention ever. I don't know who did that, but you shouldn't store your eggs in the door and they should be in a closed container. And that way they won't pick up any smells or tastes from other food that might be in the refrigerator and it'll keep them fresh and usable longer. Thank you. So again, if this is something that is uh, supposed to determine what breed you are going to get, is the longevity of the laying hen per year on and over the years. So laying starts at five to six weeks and you can get up to 250 plus or minus eggs depending on the breed. And this, the eggs are smaller to begin with, the smaller the chicken, well, younger chicken will lay smaller eggs, they get bigger with time, then as she ages, the eggs stay big, but they get fewer. And Again, depending on the breed, menopause could happen at three or six years, depending on the breed, and how much you've been working this chicken as well. Those who provide way much more light so that this chicken doesn't stop laying in the winter because laying is uh, daylight sensitive, uh, then you're really working this chicken. And remember you are born with a, <clears throat> if you're a chicken laying hen, you're born with a finite number of eggs. So if they are laid sooner and faster, then that menopause comes sooner. And so you got all those choices there that I have highlighted. And then you have dual purpose breeds showing down there. The picture you see there is an or or Americana, which is a breed between an American one and one from Chile, from South America. They're the ones that are the blue eggs. Okay, we'll switch gears a little bit here and talk about pastured poultry. Some of you who are maybe in commercial business, raising pastured poultry is an added value to the products, mostly meat that you may be raising. So the outside, it's a comfortable place, you have healthy living conditions and there's possibility of exercise and happy chickens. And research, by the way, has shown that happy animals provide higher quality products, at least with beef cattle, that has been shown. And of course, in confinement, you can have health issues and chickens have feelings too. They wanna come out and play, just like everybody. And I, I now know how chickens feel with this lockdown. And then there's much more nutrition on pasture because there is, in addition to the feed you give them, they are able to take on other vegetation there and maybe grab a, a worm there and an insect over there. And the eggs end up being uh, richer in omega-3 fatty acids that we like beta carotene, which is a precursor to vitamin A, and less risk of disease. And maybe, well, okay, let's go on. When you're in pasture, you need these types of um, housings. First of all, they're more or less, they have to be movable because you want to, these chickens to eat and they graze. Believe it or not, when they go to a place, they really graze just like cows and leave it bare, but at the same time, they fertilize it. So you want to move them over to the next spot. So they are movable. The top right hand one is quite fancy and bigger, can hold more chickens. This, the one at the bottom there, quite a number of people when you're raising 50 birds, it's a good one. Half of it covered, half uncovered. And the top one there, you just added a little bit of area to your chicken coop way back there. And I don't know if you can see, it's also sound, serves as a child care center. The chickens and the kids get along just fine. So those are the tractors you use in pastured poultry. And then they say all these breeds are great and I added the turkeys, which we are not talking about here and the ducks. But mostly people will use the Cornish crop rock out in pasture so that they can get out of there, make the money, make their money and move on. Okay. 
What's free range? Chickens that are allowed outside like this and they have access to the sun and this freedom of foraging and, and maybe dust, bath, dust bathing are free range. They don't have to be out in the open as such. They can also be in an enclosed area, but they have access to the sun. They came out of the coop. So that's, that's some element of free range, not necessarily allowing them to go in the woods wherever they want to, okay? And pasture in pastured poultry is important. One, uh, get it to, well, the bigger the better, of course. Three to four inches is good for the chickens. You don't want them uh, in eight, 10 inches of grass. They will not have a good time eating that. But three to four inches shorter is better. Why would a chicken eat grass when it is a monogastric? It's not a herbivore. And talking to a few people, they've told me that one, it provides some roughage, which is great for, the di for digestion. And secondly, uh, with uh, some, some uh, level of digestion, there are some juices, chlorophyll, that will come out of those leaves and that will help the chicken. And then within the vegetation, of course, there are all those great things, uh, the worms and all that. Um, but make sure that you don't have toxic plants also in the places where you're moving these chickens because they're going to check it out and you don't want them dropping. If they you also need to make sure like there are certain plants that'll cause your eggs to go like off flavor. Mm -hmm. um, feeds feeds can do that too if they've got a lot of fish meal or something in them. But like if they get into a patch of onions and then you eat the eggs, you'll probably be able to tell uh -huh. because it'll be in the eggs. But another thing to note that if you're doing all this pastured poultry and then you have and you're selling eggs, the egg yolks during the summer months are probably going to be a lot darker, more yellow or orange than the ones in the, the fall if they're mm -hmm. eating more food inside or there isn't any access to pasture. Okay, all right. Thank you for that point. Mm -hmm. Now, chickens know better than us. They are already eating insects, which are extremely high in protein. And uh, we are starting to advocate that people should also be eating insects because they're high in protein. And this cartoon here, and I'm not going to go through it, tells you that protein content in caterpillars it's really high or if you eat a cricket or a termite or like the large grasshoppers there or look at that uh, uh, um. there are actually a lot of studies going on right now and in the past mm. few years on insect meal being included in diets for poultry as well as for people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. somebody asked about fencing and i have been to a few homes i don't know if Steve is on, but Steve has been using electric fencing for chickens quite effectively. And um, that would be one way of keeping out the predators and keeping your chickens in. So you keep what you want to keep in, in, and what you want to keep out, out. The dogs and the coyotes and weasels and other things. But if you can also eliminate the bushes around where uh, the predators may be hiding, you know, uh, you'll be doing your chickens a good time. I think I've seen one or two people using guard dogs. The dogs are just there with the chickens. They do help quite a bit as well. Chicken manure, the importance of chicken manure. I'm not spend a lot of time here, but I just want you to note the item on nitrogen. And we are comparing poultry, the chickens, with pig manure and mushroom compost and biosolids. Biosolid is just a polite word for human waste. And you can see nothing compares, nothing is even close to the amount of nitrogen in chicken droppings. Very high level of nitrogen. That's the point I want to make, you, make here. So when you move your chickens around your property there, 
you get lots of free nitrogen. Let's talk about stressors and that, that can uh, afflict chickens. Um, I started off with this picture just because it's showing a whole lot of things that can stress chickens. See at the top there, ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. If you don't have well ventilated poop, you get lots of that. It's not great for the respiratory system and so is dust or mycotoxins and a whole lot of other things if you didn't vaccinate your chicks when they were young and then daddy water, we trim the beaks because these chickens might start eating eggs and molting and when all these things are stressful for the chicken. If you can eliminate all these things, you'll be having chickens that don't even get sick for that matter. And so you have that picture, you can look at it and check all those things. But I don't want us, I didn't want us to spend time talking about 14 diseases that can affect chickens. First of all, these pictures can be discouraging. It might discourage you from keeping chickens. However, your chicks, when they arrive, already have a coccid. Um, uh, they already have a vaccination against Marex disease, which is virus caused, which is showing, which I've written there. Buy chicks from a hatchery. Normally, they say for like, I don't know, 25 or 50 cents a bird, they'll vaccinate them. And they do have coccidiosis vaccines now available at hatcheries as well. Okay. And I see if they didn't do that, you can just go to Farm and Fleet or wherever and get Coccidiostat, which you just put in water and the chicks take that up as a... And as actually a, most, most starter feed or like broiler feed already mm -hmm. has the Coccidiostat in it. Okay, all right, very well. It's called it, medicated feed, that's what it's medicated for. Right, right. Avian flu, if your chicks or your chickens don't have too much contact with migratory birds, you might again be free of that. And then you have other bacteria and fungi that can affect birds. And then you have pests like lice and ticks that get into the way of the feathers. And by the way, the chick that is showing there, that's a symptom of the Marex disease, the virus induced disease. And you see some pictures of ticks and somebody there trying to vaccinate this chicken, maybe again it's Marex disease or maybe less likely coccidio coccidiosis because that one can be administered differently. That might be, I don't know, that's weird. I've never seen a chick vaccinated like that, but they could be gavaging it for like laryngeotracheitis, which is something we don't have to worry about around here. Right. In all my life, keeping chickens, I haven't had a chicken go sick. So you keep this chicken, or in fact, let's go to the next slide. If you are secure in, or pre protective or preventative of, of your activities and keep your chickens in good condition, in sanitary condition, in well-fed, and if you have a large place where people, if you have very many chickens and people want to go in there, have them step on some damp cloth that has um, uh, sanitizer in it. You know, if you do all those things and these chickens are not crowded and they are not, they're well ventilated, it's very unlikely that you get these diseases. So just be, um, nice and take, them, take care of these chickens. You will not get these diseases. So sanitation, restricting visitors, keeping wild birds away if you can, buying feed from reliable source, separating, oh yeah, if you, if you get the one bird which for some reason is starting to doze, you can see it starting to doze, I think it get it away from everybody else and maybe ask for diagnosis, you know, take a picture, write to me, I have my email there, and describe. 
Chickens are really good at trying to hide their diseases too. So by the time you see something, sometimes it's past what a vet or I can do. And it's really hard for me to diagnose chickens over the phone or via email, but pictures definitely help. They help, yes. There's one lady here, up here who lost one of the chickens. She had 10, lost one of them, went to the woods, 10 days after she, the, the bird, that chicken came right back. She was so happy to have it back. Put it in with everybody else, the nine died, it survived. So it went and got something out there in the woods and brought it back home. So again, just things like those happen. So just be careful. The other question that came up in, uh, you know, from one of you participants who registered was, how are we going to do uh, to winterize our coops? As it Am I going to heat or not to heat? But let's, let's, let's first of all talk about some facts. Chickens are built or they have feathers and they know how to keep warm. And if your coop doesn't have a draft and they are not stressed by the cold, they can keep way warm way much better. And if they are on a patch and they are close to each other, they keep each other warm too. And as you can see on that, you know, the picture on that uh, chicken, the, the, the feathers have been puffed out. And this chicken has created an insulation of air between itself and between the feathers and the body. That is an insulation of sorts and it can keep much better. And this is shown figuratively on this slide where the body is in red and the feathers are in black and the gray area there is the layer of insulation from trapped air that the chicken holds. So chickens know how to take care of themselves. Uh, however, uh, if, the, if the temperatures are less than zero, if our chicken wouldn't be a time to be having babies or eggs. I would prioritize what I want to, to do. So blood circulation, breathing, and generating heat would be the top priority, which means what? Also give it higher quality feed or give them enough food to, to, to com for combustion to make you know, uh, heat. Now, if water freezes, and that's another thing you want to do during winter. You want to be checking on your water, change that frequently. If not, get a heating pad so that the water never freezes. Because if, if, the, if the water freezes, the birds will keep off the feed and then they start getting stressed because they cannot produce heat for the body and all that and all that. Molting may occur. What is molting? It's the loss of feathers. Um, it's losing feathers so that you can get new feathers. That's, that's the thing, and it can be stressful. And some people induce that molting process so that it can happen sooner, so that this chicken can start laying again, because it's a factory. At that, that, that point, it's not just a chicken. You're making it a factory for making eggs. So I don't like that because that's interfering with the natural processes myself. That's really asking for too much from the chicken. Then collect your eggs frequently and regularly. Don't let them go too long in the coop there in the nest because it's a freezer. And once that, the inside freezes, they start cracking. And cooking that egg or defrosting that egg becomes a bit of a challenge and now it's open to the other elements the bacteria and all that so you want to get uh, regular at collecting the eggs over exposure to cold temperatures uh, the chickens that have a very big comb uh, do get a frost frostbite and it chickens we said chickens have feelings too it is painful for them like, like it would be painful for you and me 
And therefore, if this hard really happens, then you might consider warming the coop for part of the time of the day, not all the day, maybe not during the day, save your, save your beer. And uh, the older birds will not take the cold as well as the younger ones. And I have read somewhere that if you get petroleum jelly and smear it on the comb, you might help them some. And I, I, I did that with the, with the three uh, um, leghorns that I have here. And I think it helped. In cold weather, make sure that all cracks have been sealed. Make sure that your coop is structurally sound. Maybe even install a wind barrier that is affecting the coop. And then keep, his, keep the coop stress-free. You empty, you clean it up, uh, parasite-free. All these fleas and lice, if they are there, the chicken will spend most of his time doing other things rather than being comfortable, all right? So as long as you don't have the drafty winds and you have ventilation and a clean environment, you should just be fine. You should be okay. And if you decide to heat the coop, then they go online, all these different types of heaters there. I've heard of some bulbs, the cheaper ones, can actually fracture and, yeah, what is the word? Uh, break. Um, somebody who keeps sheep in, used to live in Champagne, he had these infrared lamps and it happened in the, the, the pen where the, the lambs were, and it actually started a fire. However, that's a one in a million chance that it will happen. I haven't heard of incidences that are so many incidences. That's one in very many uh, incidences, uh, usages of this uh, lamp. You don't have this picture, but if you want to play with your chickens, play with them. But there are people saying, you know, don't, don't mess with the chickens. Just don't do it. Leave them alone. That's the other picture that I had earlier on, I think. They're pets, okay. So do what you want to do with them. <laughs> oh. If you want to hit the coop, again, try to do it at night so that you save on your bill. This looks like it is a duplication of that other slide. What, can, what else can you do for chickens? Keep them busy. They are bored. They have feelings too. Get the mixed seed and just give them a handful. This is not food. This is not their major meal. This is unbalanced. This is cracked corn or other types of barley and what have you, that kind of seed. Throw it on the ground, let them scratch and have a little snack. And there are people who have said they have sprouted seed or done microgreens or taken chicken. Well, I take chicken scraps over there, that's for sure. Just let them nibble at something else and keep them busy. Pam uh, just mentioned about mealworms. Those other treats you can just throw a few. They just, they like a, 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 a stimulus variation. So, yeah, remove the boredom somehow. So it's winter, do you wanna keep them indoors in the coop for 24 hours? No, let them go out if they wanna, you know, let them step out. What I have seen is once they step out and find, you know, there's nothing to eat out here, it's just lots of snow and it is cold anyway, they just go right back in. So try to, you know, be nice to them. Insulate the coop. Uh, do not heat your coop 24 hours. That's what we said earlier on. And gather your eggs regularly if you have the laying type that are still laying during winter. Um, frozen water is not good. We know that. Grit. What is grit? Grit would be Sunday. Okay, if you have sand and it has the bigger particles. Let the chickens pick that up. It helps in digestion. It grinds whatever is in the crop of, you know, the stomach of the chicken. So let them pick that up a little bit. And 
I have some references. The first, two, the first one is U of I reference. And the second two will help anyone that wants to do a chicken coop. The third one, Mississippi State University, if you want to read about um, pests and diseases, go ahead and do that. The last one by Bolan was the one that was showing about the usefulness of chicken manure, the high nitrogen content. And the other reference there was given to us by Pam two years ago, Guide to Backyard Chickens. By, this is a magazine called Grit, I think has, by the way, you can, you can subscribe to that because they talk quite a bit about chickens. I've seen that they do that quite a bit. And for more info, you can either write to me or Ken Kokobek, Kokobek, Dr. K, we call him. And I'm also going to give you Pam's email here in a minute when I'm done. Um, and then I sent you some chicken photos that are great just for you to enjoy. And then there are these questions that you asked before as you registered, you asked, hey, can you address some of these questions? Wintertime care of chickens, I hope I've said enough, you know, the making sure that the structural soundness and making sure you feed them good enough amount of food and removing as much stress of the stresses as possible, if you do that. And then you have the right breed of chicken as well, the road iron reds and the bad rock and all those that can withstand the leghorns. If you, if, if you get all these things um, together, you should be good to go. The other question was the day-to-day -day schedule, the workload, which is obviously not as intensive as a dairy, but it is, is it reasonable for a busy family that has gone overnight once in a while? Would my pet sitter be able to handle the amount of care needed? And the answer is yes. Water may run out. The chickens, if, it, if the waterer is sitting on a block like the one we saw, they could knock it over. But if you're hanging that feeder and you know that these birds take three to four days to finish that, and your water, if it's hanging too and it takes another three to four days, yes, you can, you can be gone on vacation or wherever for three to four to five days and somebody else can just come in and check on water. It's very easy. And then maybe picking the eggs. And I don't know if something else, Pam, you can add to that. How to use your deck to make a chicken coop? And I got that picture on the top right hand corner there. Just to imagine a deck, this end of the deck, and I just want to put two chickens there, two hens, and put, yes, I could do, you could do it there. Then you'll have to be very uh, hygienic, I guess. You'll have to sweep more often so that your deck, when you're sitting over there, there's no, not much of smell. And by the way, somehow I don't sense chicken poop smelling that much even when I go out there. If you have plenty of litter, I mean the pine shavings or whatever, that in itself absorbs most of what comes out of the chicken and somehow it degrades quickly enough. And two chickens should not be a whole lot of manure anyway. So it's doable. You can have them dust bathing down there, they can come up here and then with proper ventilation, you could you could have it on deck. And I don't know if I've answered the question there well enough. Care of chickens in all weather and seasons. So that's like everything we've been talking about from food, from baby chickens, from predators, from the from snow from rain you know the wind the drafty wind so i hope i have addressed that unless there is one little bit of something that i haven't talked about okay 
chicken food, chicken hygiene and care, and movable coops. Again, I think I have mentioned the coops that are movable. And from pictures that you saw, it's, it's not that, it's not rocket science making these things. Hygiene and care, unless you want us to do another class where we talk about all the diseases and the tests and all that, which would take another hour. Uh, if you would like us to do that, I, I can arrange to have that done. Chicken food, if you want the specifics, you know what it, what's for energy, what's for uh, building muscles, the proteins, what's for vitamins, what's for other things. I can come up with some tables that show you the chick, the starter feed, the grower ration, and then the finishing ration. If you want to make your own, I can come up with that type of thing. But otherwise, I survive on just going to farm and feed and just buying the different types of feed. When I buy feed, I don't buy the one that is, I buy the one that is more pellet-like as opposed to the one that is flour, you know, like the, the mush one. They tend to waste more of the other one as opposed to the pellet. The pellet is picked as a whole pellet and the other one they keep scratching to look for the bigger uh, particles. So I tend to buy the one that is pelleted. Best chickens for egg laying now from our presentation here. It is all, up your own, it's your prerogative. It's what you like. And the choices are out there. And the best hen houses to keep out predators. Okay, just like the picture now showing on bottom right hand corner there. I mean, it would have to be a very determined dog to tear it to a coyote or a weasel to tear down this structure to get to the chickens. Now, of course, if it's a bear, it's going to knock this over. And, um, well, the other thing, of course, to make sure that you have taken care of is that this structure is well tethered to the ground so that strong winds, like that some of the ones that blow here in Chicago and surrounding areas, don't knock this over because that would be disposing, predisposing these animals to predators. So again, I hope the presentation has answered that question. And chickens cohabitate in the same enclosure with other animals, such as rabbits. Let's start with the rabbits. I was against having rabbits with chickens and turkeys and ducks. I think the rabbits are too small and cannot get out of the way of these bigger animals. So I don't think rabbits would be a good choice. But I've seen people raising chickens with ducks and turkeys and sheep and goats. Yes, that has, I've seen that happen. However, I've also seen the recommendation that there's this one disease, is it called blackhead, that gets into turkey, turkeys, and, and, and uh, it has dire consequences for those big birds. The chickens don't seem to get that blackhead disease, but they are carriers of the pathogen that causes the disease. So again, that's a recommendation. But I've seen people raise these animals, you know, old McDonald's farm, everybody is all together. I would prefer to have them separate if I was doing it myself. The coop divided into two and have the bigger birds on their own and the hands on the other side. And they also tend to be too big for the chickens anyway. They kind of outcompete them, push them out of the way. And of course they are stronger and bigger. So um, I don't know if Pam is still on, but I don't know what she would think about that one. Methods to ensure great ventilation in the coop. My setup is in an old shed and I will need to cut some ventilation holes in it too, or maybe put in an exhaust fan. First of all, an old shed has lots of room 
above the chicken. The chicken has only one foot from the ground or maybe 10 feet from the ground, but you have another maybe 10, 20 feet above the chicken. There's lots of room for air to just circulate or just get out of the way of the chickens at their level. A, an old barn, there's, a, there's one lady who is keeping chickens in the barn with the horses and all that. There are no holes to ventilate, okay, the door has some gaps, yes. But during the day when she opens the door, it, it's ventilated quite easily again. When you have that much room, you're fine. It's the small coops where you only have just a few cubic feet of room that you don't really have enough of ventilation that you can have an issue now. The same air is coming back to the chickens, the circulating in there. But a big shed, if it's big enough, you might not even have to worry about ventilation. Um, the coop, let's go back to the coop. If your floor is with the fine mesh, that one is great because air can come from underneath. As long as it's not drafty, you wanna prevent it from being drafty, coming from underneath and going up, going out through like the hole you see, the window that you see way up there. So that helps again for the ventilation. I've seen some, some that don't even have uh, chicken wire on the base there, and they just have a closed floor, not open, and they still just work fine. As long as you have that top window there so that warm air, warm air rises, cold air comes down. That works too. So I don't know if I've answered the question. And yes, if you wanna to go to the extent of having a fan that is taking out the air and using a solar power or even wind power, fair enough. But I don't think you need to do that. And unless you are in a, I don't know, maybe the ask of this question is in a commercial setup. Then yeah, when there are too many birds and I've seen that, that happen. The big, big, big uh, chicken house has some fans that will take out most of the air. And it can get hot in July, of course. So I'm not sure if I answered the question well enough. But I guess that's what. And I think, I think we are done. Is everybody still there? Yes, thank you very much, James. We do have some questions in the box. Um, the first one, um, can you clarify uh, when hens start laying? Is it like five or six months or five or six weeks? I think there was a confusion there when you first mentioned that. I did confuse you, yes. It's six, five months. Okay. I, sorry, I'm sorry. It's five it's to six months. Okay. It it depends on. I should have stuck. Oh, I should have stuck to 18, 18 weeks. It's how many months? That's four months, right? Five months, almost. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Pam is talking. I think. It depends on the type of bird. White leghorns will usually come into egg production anywhere from fifteen to twenty weeks of age. Brown egg layers, which is what most people will have, probably start laying anywhere from 18 to 24 weeks. So anywhere in the, you know, four or five month range is probably what you're looking at for a brown egg layer, dual purpose. Okay, great, thank you. Another okay. question, um, chickens versus voles, who wins? I do. <laughs> I think the vole loses, <laughs> yes. If the voles get into the chicken coop, the, 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 no, if the vole gets into the chicken coop, the chickens will really run after it and keep it out of there. However, it. however, if it is able to hide in the nooks and cracks in there, that's not good because it wins and it comes back to eat the food, the chicken food and poops in it. And I don't know if there are any diseases they can bring in, it, 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 yeah. Okay, 
There was a question on Bumblefoot, and I believe Pam addressed that in the chat box. So if there's anybody that uh, hadn't seen that, there is a message in there from Pam concerning the Bumblefoot question. Maybe you could say what she said, so in case somebody isn't able to get to the chat box. Yeah, uh, Bumblefoot occurs when a sore on the foot gets infected. This can happen if the bedding is too hard and they jump off a roost or a nest box. Uh, Pam just usually pulls off the scab and presses, uh, presses out the pus. They are um, normally fine after that, but you may need to do this a few times. If the hole is deep, you may want to isolate the bird and keep it off the floor in a raised wire cage until healed. Good, good answer, thank you very much. Um, let's see, we have other questions that we have here. Um, the other thing is that the, uh, there is a question in there concerning uh, coops with dark metal roofs. Um, and so when you're talking about temperatures inside the coop, how hot is too hot in the chicken coop? It really depends on your airflow. I mean, it can be hot and it depends a lot on the humidity as well. They have a lot more problems down in the south uh, keeping like laying hens and stuff ventilated. It depends on a lot of factors. The dark roof kind of throws me off because that's going to have a lot of heat. But if you've got enough airflow through there, that should be fine. And yes, you want, there has to be airflow in any coop that you have. I know that you're not supposed to have drafts on baby chickens, but I'm mainly talking about like larger chickens. The building is probably fine for chicks, but. Okay, so it looks like. And for us, for us backyard uh, chicken raisers, if you just have a small coop, chickens, if it gets too hot in there, they'll come out. They'll come, back, they'll come out to the running pen. So it shouldn't really be a problem. But you're right, Pam, I agree with you. A uh, dark roof is an absorber of heat. So yeah, they could be pecking in there. Of course, they have to go in there to lay eggs, but they'll come out as soon as they need to. And I believe there was an addition to that. It says the shed has a very low roof. It's only about seven foot at the peak. That shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Excellent. Unless you hit your head, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Don't let don't let the bedding build up and the poop build up. So you got to bend. You know, it's yeah. Low roof is a, but that's the way a lot of the old chicken coops were. They were real. They're just big enough for you to walk in the one end, and they kind of tapered down to the other. End. Okay. Great. Um, those are all the questions that we have in the chat box. Is there anything else that you or Pam want to discuss before we close out? Pam, your email is utterback at illinois.edu, right? It's utterback without the A, so it's utterbook. Book, okay, utterback, okay. So, right. um, B-C-K. Is it showing there? Is it showing on the screen for everyone? No, uh, Ken's and Pam's, yes. Yes, I'm on there now. Okay, okay. great, thank you. So uh, since it is uh, about 11.30, so I'd like to thank our presenters, uh, Dr. Thury and Pam, for sharing their information and knowledge on poultry production. I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us on this webinar. I hope you received some information that will help you with your poultry production. Again, thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rory.